Well, let's lift our hands to the Most High God and begin to worship Him. Let's worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Let's worship the Ancient of Days. Give Him glory, give Him honor, give Him adoration. Bless His holy name. It's worthy to be praised, it's worthy to be adored, magnify His holy name. Praise the King of Kings, praise the Lord of Lords, praise the Ancient of Days, praise the Prince of Peace, give him glory, give him honor, give him adoration, bless him. He's worthy, he's worthy to be praised. Let him hear your voice. Give him glory, give him honor. Give him adoration. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Give him glory. Give him honor. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Magnify his holy name. Oh, yes, Father, we bless your name. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you adoration, we bless your holy name. Thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we worship. Now you've prayed for the country, you've prayed for the church, you've prayed for the family. It's time to pray for yourself. Lift your voice to the Almighty God, loud and clear, and say, Father, Father Prince, of Peace, Prince of Peace, prove yourself in my life tonight. Go ahead, talk to the Almighty God. Prince of Peace, just prove yourself in my life tonight. All I'm asking you to do is prove to me tonight that you are the Prince of Peace indeed. Prove yourself in my life tonight. Prove yourself in my life tonight. Prince of Peace, prove yourself in my life tonight. Show me that you are truly the Prince of Peace. Show me tonight. Prove yourself. Just prove yourself in my life tonight. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And you lift your voice to him once again and say, Father, by the time I live here, let me sing a new song of victory. Go ahead, talk to the Almighty God. Father, please, by the time I live here, let me sing a new song of victory, a new song of peace, a new song of joy. Let me sing a new song by the time I leave here. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Almighty. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be your name. 
Hallelujah, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, O oh Lord. Mighty is your name, mighty is your name. Hallelujah, mighty is your name. Hallelujah, mighty is your name. Hallelujah, oh my Jesus, your name, my Jesus, your name, my Jesus, your name, oh Lord, Jesus is your name, Jesus is your name, hallelujah, Jesus is your name, hallelujah. Jesus is your name, oh Lord, hallelujah, oh Jesus is your name, Jesus is your name, hallelujah, Jesus is your name. Ancient of days, the unchangeable changer, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the holy one of Israel, the one who can do and undo. Glory be to your holy name. We thank you for all you've already done tonight. We thank you for all you've done in the past FOL. We thank you for what you are about to do now. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, tonight, surprise us Amen. with your healing, Amen. with your deliverance, Amen. with breakthroughs, Amen. with signs, Amen. with wonders, Amen. with all manners of miracles. Amen. Please surprise us tonight. Let every one of us live here with at least a testimony. Yeah. Let this night be a night we will never forget. Yeah. Thank you, my Father and my God. And please, Lord, heal this land. Yeah. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Let somebody shout a big hallelujah. Well, I shake hands with one or two people and say, God is about to surprise you. And if you believe that, let me hear you shout another hallelujah. And you please may be seated. I want to really, really thank the Almighty God for my grandson. Uh, who did a, an excellent job. You know, some big, big names will come and talk for an hour. And at the end of the one hour, you ask yourself, what has he said? But here is a young man who spoke for less than 40 minutes. And he's giving you seven things that you must do to enjoy peace. I don't know about you, I wrote the seven steps down. And I'm going to begin to practice them. Uh, I was scared in my prayer room when he said his text is Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. I said, oh God, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because that was the text I was going to choose before the Holy Spirit said, go somewhere else. <laughs> it would have been a serious situation here tonight. God bless you, sir. Thank you very much. And come again soon. Glory be to God. How many of us are attending the Epwell for the first time? Raise your hand. Let me see. Oh, okay. Well, you will get a first-time miracle tonight in Jesus' name. Now, because there are so many of you, I need to quickly explain uh, how we operate here so that we can move together in the same wavelength. That is what we call the language of the Holy Spirit. When God wants to talk to a congregation, no matter how large, he addresses himself to individuals. So as we go along, you may hear there is someone here, and then something, something follows. And at the end of the day, you discover that instead of one person, there are hundreds of people. Don't think we have made a mistake. That's the way God speaks. For example, there is someone here tonight who will never weep again. Yeah. Where is that someone? Yeah. Okay, if you are the one, let me hear you say amen again. Yeah. The second thing is that the Holy Spirit flows like a river. Uh, in, in John chapter 9 from verse 37 to 39, the Bible tells us that Jesus was talking about rivers flowing, and he was referring to the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of us who came from villages, when you go to the village stream to fetch water, when it is your turn to dip in the bucket and bring out your water, if you hesitate, the river will not wait for you. So tonight, if while we are going on, you doze up, and God mentions your case. And the fellow sitting next to you says, Amen. And then you woke up and say, what did he say? <laughs> By then it will be too late. So tell your neighbor, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> the third thing, of course, is that in some nations of the world, and I think I've discovered that here in London too, they have some restaurants where they say you can come in and eat all you can. Everybody will pay the same price, and you all go into the same restaurant, and the place is loaded 
There is chicken, there is beef, there is fish, there is rice, there is all manners of food. And they say, eat all you can. Now, some people will go into such a restaurant and they will take one little chicken, a spoon of rice, and that's all. And they will still pay the same price. I always look at such people and I wonder, what are they doing here? Because when I go to such a restaurant, by the time I leave, they would know somebody had visited them. <laughs> uh, uh, the reason I'm telling you that is that tonight, the Lord has prepared a table before you. Yeah. On the table, there is salvation. Yeah. There is healing. Yeah. There is deliverance. Yeah. There is victory. Yeah. There is the fruit of the womb. Yeah. There is joy. Yeah. There is promotion. Now, how much of it do you want? All right. Now, finally, when you go through the scriptures, you discover that almost everyone who got a miracle from God got it by faith. The Lord will ask, do you believe I can do this? If they say yes, he will say then, be it unto you according to your faith. Or he may say, your faith has made you whole. Tonight, by the special grace of God, God is here. How do I know? Number one, he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be there. Now, we are more than two or three here, so he's here. Number two is that I brought him with me. Uh, and, and I'm saying that with all humility because he promised me when he was calling me into full-time ministry, when he was asking me to leave my job, as a lecturer in the university to become a full-time pastor, he made a promise. He said, wherever you go, I will go with you. So he's here with me right now. Uh -huh. Now the question is, do you have faith that tonight is your night? When exactly do you want your miracle? I can't even hear you. Very good. Then we are all set. We'll go quickly to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Here we see the Lord Jesus Christ being given five names by his father, even before he was born. He gave him five names, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I will try as quickly as I can to go through these five names because each name has its own significance. Wonderful. Wonderful is a combination of two words, wonder and full. So wonderful means full of wonders. Now, Jesus Christ is full of wonders because, number one, he is a wonder. He himself is a wonder. John chapter 1, verse 9, John chapter 1, verse 9 calls him a lamb, the lamb of God. But Revelation chapter 5, from verse 5 to 6, Revelation 5, verse 5 to 6, calls him a lion. A lamb that is also a lion. That alone is enough to prove to you he is a wonder. But not only is he a wonder, he does wonders. The Bible was referring to him in Exodus 15, verse 11. Exodus 15, verse 11. He says, who is like unto thee, O Lord? Who is like unto thee among other gods? 
glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing what? Wonders. He does wonders. And for example, in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, they brought a man to him who was paralyzed from neck downwards. They brought him in. The man walked out. The people were amazed. Uh, somebody defined the wonder as something that causes you to wonder. So a wonder is something that causes you to be amazed. Uh, one of my children defined a wonder as something that causes your mouth to drop open involuntarily. And I'm believing that somebody will live here with a wonder tonight. He is a wonder. He does wonders. But that's not all. He can do wonders for you. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons he brought you here tonight. He wants to do wonders in your life. In Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 15, Mark 5, verse 1 to 15, the Bible tells us that when Jesus delivered a man who had a legion of demons, the people were amazed. I'm praying for someone here today that by the time you go back home, all your neighbors will be amazed at you. Uh, I'm sure you remember the story of one of my sons who, uh, whose wife had been barren for 26 years. And then uh, at my 70th birthday, I asked God for 70,000 children. And he felt that if God is going to give 70,000 children, at least he should have one. Well, he claimed it. And then the wife became pregnant and gave birth to a set of triplets. Uh, so she, he named them uh, miracles, signs, and wonders. <laughs> I am believing God for someone here today that by this time next year, you will come and present your own miracle, signs, and wonders. Glory be to God. Now, he is a wonder. He does wonders. He can do wonders for you. He can turn you to a wonder. In Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to 10, Acts 3, verse 1 to 10, when Peter, in the name of Jesus Christ, caused that lame man to walk, the man who has been lame for 40 years, when that man followed him in to the uh, temple, walking and leaping and praising God, the Bible says the people there were amazed. They looked at the man and they saw a wonder standing right there in their midst. The Almighty God can turn you to a wonder. I've told the story before of a man who uh, when we had an Holy Ghost service at the National Stadium. And uh, this man was sitting high up in the gallery. And the, the Almighty God uh, just spoke to me and said, there is a man here with a large growth in his neck and that the growth is gone. Now, if you are there, if you are a man and you have a large growth on your neck, you know human beings. Instead of looking at your face, they'll be looking at the growth. So the lady who was sitting next to him throughout the period had been glancing at the growth from the corner of her eyes. When she had that word of knowledge, she knew instinctively that it must be this man. She turned to see, and all of a sudden, the growth was gone. She was so amazed that after the program, she walked, those of you who know a little bit of Lagos, she trekked from Surulere to Pangru. Before she remembered that her car was parked at the stadium. Now that is a wonder. That kind of miracle that will cause people to forget where they were. God will perform for you tonight. 
He is a wonder. He can do wonders. He can do wonders for you. He can turn you to a wonder. And he can perform wonders through you. I'm believing God for every one of you who came here tonight, that after tonight, God will begin to perform wonders through you. In Acts chapter 19, verse 11 to 12, Acts 19, verse 11 to 12, the Bible says God did special miracles by the hand of Paul. That from his body they were taking handkerchiefs and aprons to people, and everyone who came in contact with any of his handkerchiefs got healed, and demons saw those handkerchiefs coming, and they ran. And then I can tell you a story very quickly, too. Some of you have had it before, but for those of you who are coming for the first time, I've told you the story of one day when I went to minister at the University of Obafemi Awolowo University in Ife. And uh, it was raining heavily. And it was an open field program. But the student didn't leave. And I was just wondering, why are they so determined? to wait till the end of the program. I didn't know they had a plan. By the time I finished preaching, they took the chair that I was sitting on and cut it to pieces. So everybody had a little piece. And one of the testimonies that followed from that is that there was one young man there. His sister had been mad for 16 years. He took his own little bit to the sister, touch her with the piece, and the ladies snapped out of the insanity and became completely normal. <laughs> she said, I have had a long, bad dream. Everybody said, oh, yes. They didn't bother to tell her that for the last 16 years, she had been insane. I'm not asking you to destroy the chair here today. <laughs> I am saying that one to let you know that you too one day will become a wonder and God will perform wonders through you in Jesus' name. So his first name is Wonderful because he is a wonder, he does wonders, he can do wonders for you, he can turn you to a wonder and he can perform wonders through you. The second name is Cancelor. Now, a Cancelor is someone you go to when you are in a tight corner and you need somebody who is wiser than you to advise you on what to do. Now, Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to 21, Daniel 2, verse 20 to 21, tells us that Wisdom belongs to God and is the one who gives wisdom to the wise. So if you need counsel, if you need advice, if you don't know what to do next, the person to go to is Jesus because he is the counselor. And when we talk about the counsel, the kind of counsel we are talking about now, we're talking about some very serious situations when you can't just go to any other human, human being for advice, like in Genesis 41, from verse 1 to 44. Genesis 41, 1 to 44. Pharaoh had two dreams, one after the other, and each one shook him. And he called all his wise men together to try and interpret the dream. They couldn't. Then they sent for a man in prison, Joseph. They said, this man can interpret any kind of dream. That's the kind of advice we are talking about. When you have a situation beyond human understanding and you need help. Or you take Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, from verse 1 to the end. It tells us about the story of uh, another king. This time, he had a dream. The dream frightened him. By the time he woke up, he had forgotten the dream. Now, he wanted somebody to tell him the dream that he dreamt, and he had forgotten, and to interpret it for him. 
Now, when you have that kind of problem, you, you need divine wisdom. You need that counselor that is above ordinary. And of course, they sent for Daniel, and he gave him the interpretation. And I'll give you just one example. One of my daughters came to me several years ago. I said, Daddy, I have a problem. I said, what is the problem? He said, six brothers, six brothers, came to me in one week. And they all say, thus saith the Lord, you are my wife. <laughs> I mean, the kind of problem many people have is that no brother came. <laughs> now, six came. <laughs> he said, Daddy, which one of the six is the correct one? <laughs> I said, Lord, have mercy. You will have to come back for an answer. Because to answer that question, I need to go to the counselor. And the counselor told me what to tell her. My dear, when they come to you, just tell them, Thank you very much. I have heard what you have said, but I need to let you know I am not getting married for the, within the next seven years. Whichever one of the six says, seven years or ten, I will wait. That's the correct one. <laughs> she told the six of them, they all said, uh, we will go and pray again. If you are in any tight corner tonight, God will bring you out. Yeah. His third name is Mighty God. Psalm 91 verse 1 calls him the Almighty. Psalm 91 verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Mighty God, not mighty man. Mighty God, the one, thank you, Father. <laughs> it's early tonight. The Lord said there's someone here tonight. He said, against all odds, you will reach the top. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Father. Mighty God, not mighty man, because no matter how strong a man may be, he will grow tired. But this God we're talking about, the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, Isaiah 40, verse 28, he never grows tired, he's never weary. According to Jeremiah 32, verse 27, Jeremiah 32, verse 27, he is the God of all flesh. There is nothing too hard for him to do. According to Luke chapter 1, verse 37, Luke chapter 1, verse 37, the Bible says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And so we're talking about the mighty God now, not mighty man, the one who can do all things, the one who can do absolutely impossible things which reminds me of a testimony we had in Canada in June when we went there for their convention. A lady came forward to give a testimony. She said in one of the conventions that we have done in the past, uh, people lined up and they were all struggling to touch the chair the geo sat on. She said in her own case, she just said, let them keep the geo's chair. She just went to Mommy Jill's chair, stayed there, and said to God, God, the doctors have told me I can never have a child because my womb is not properly formed. I have no ovary. I have no tubes. But this woman who sat here doesn't need the womb anymore. She doesn't need ovaries anymore. She doesn't need tubes anymore. Give me her own. <laughs> Do you know when she was giving the testimony, she had two babies already? Because there is a God who can do the impossible. 
everything that the people of the world are called impossible in your life shall become possible tonight. His fourth name is Everlasting Father. Thank you, Father. Somebody had just said something to God. And the Lord says, you just said, Lord, give me a testimony too. The Lord asked me to tell you, I will give you a big one. Yeah. Everlasting Father, again, is a combination of two words, as you can see clearly. Father and Everlasting. We all know that the young will grow. No matter how strong you are now, you will grow old one day. I mean, if you read First Kings chapter one, verse one to four, First Kings chapter one, verse one to four, David, the the, the giant killer, <laughs> at a stage, wax old. He became feeble. He became so feeble that when they covered him with blanket, he couldn't even get warm. But in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 13, verse 8, Hebrews 13, verse 8, the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never grows old. He never dies. Exodus 1, verse 8 to 10, teaches us a big lesson. Exodus 1, verse 8 to 10, teaches us that your supporter may die. The fellow who you are relying upon, sooner or later, will die. The Bible says, a king arose in Egypt that didn't know Joseph. Uh, there was a time when Joseph was riding high, but all of a sudden, the king that knew him dies. And another king arose that didn't know Joseph at all. So your supporter may die. But according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Revelation 1, verse 8, the Bible made it clear. Jesus Christ says, not only is he Alpha and Omega, not only is he the one who died and rose from the dead, he said, I am alive forevermore. With Jesus Christ as your supporter, as your father, the, that father is an everlasting father. He will support you all the days of your life. I won't spend much time on the everlasting father because we've already discussed the everlasting father in one of the Holy Ghost services we had uh, earlier this year. I, I think it's in Manchester. So if you want to hear the details about him being the everlasting father, being the source, the provider, the guide, the teacher, etc., etc., Play a hand on the tape, and you will know all the details about him being the everlasting father. And if you have him as your everlasting father, then he will make sure that your dreams, your visions, your ambitions will come to pass. Because according to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, Habakkuk chapter any vision he has given to you, because he is the everlasting father, he will bring it to pass. It reminds me of something that happened 30 years ago. My wife and I, we went to uh, South Korea, and there we saw a prayer mountain built by Young Gi Cho. I saw what was happening there, and it touched my heart deeply, it touched my wife also very deeply. And, and I wished within me, and I didn't know she was thinking the same thing, that we could have such a prayer village of international standard in Nigeria. So we, we discussed it, but then, <laughs> We didn't even have money to buy to a hut, not to talk of a mountain. And, but the dream stayed. It was there, but there was no means to fulfill it. Until I was approaching 70. And I said to my wife, 
You know this dream about the prayer village we had? He, he said, yes, I remember. <laughs> you know, the, man, the moment you pass 70, any day you are spending after that is extra time. 70, if you go at 70, you haven't died yet. Let us see how far God will help us to bring in this dream to pass. And I thank the almighty God that this year, the dream of 30 years became fulfilled. <laughs> and now I'm decreeing tonight, it doesn't matter how long you have had the dream, it will come to pass in Jesus' name. <laughs> and now, we come to the one we want to discuss tonight. The fifth name, Prince of Peace. Let's define that name. Let's break it down to pieces so that we can understand fully. Who is a prince? According to the scriptures, a prince is a ruler. According to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4. And another name or another meaning of prince is controller. According to Daniel chapter 1, verse 7 to 10, Daniel 1, verse 7 to 10, also says a prince is a controller. So when we talk about prince of peace, Take note, we're talking about a ruler of peace or controller of peace. Then what do we mean by peace? Peace could be defined in uh, one or two ways. One, we can call it absence of war. For example, Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 24 to 25, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25 to 24, the Bible says Solomon had peace all round. In other words, they, he had no wars at all. Now, if we say absence of war, what does that mean? It means you have no enemies. Or it could mean that all your enemies have been destroyed. Daniel chapter 6, verse 24 to 28. Daniel 6, 24 to 28. When they brought Daniel out of the den of lions, all his enemies were asked to go and pay a visit to the lions. None of them came back alive. All his enemies were destroyed. From that day onward, Daniel never had another problem. I'm believing God for someone here tonight. Just like the preacher who spoke before me said, this will be the last time you ever had problems. Yeah. Either your enemies are destroyed or they are scattered. Like in Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 7. Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 and 7, the Bible says, if you will hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all that he commands you, he said one of the blessings that will come upon you and overtake you is that all the enemies that come against you one way shall be smitten before you, and they shall flee seven ways. Now, if all your enemies are scattered, then peace comes. Another way you could have peace is if your enemies are paralyzed. And I, I think I told some people maybe last Sunday, I said, this is one I like a lot. That's in Psalm 23, verse 5. Psalm 23, verse 5 says, Thou preparest a table before me, where? In the presence of my enemies. Uh, so I said, those of you who pray that all your enemies should die, maybe a few should be left behind so that they can observe you when the Almighty God has brought his glory to pass in your life. But they become paralyzed and they be unable to do anything about it. Or your enemy could be subdued. 
In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, Proverbs 16, verse 7, the Bible says, when a man's ways please God, it will cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. Or there is yet another way by which you can be at peace uh, without any war at all. Daniel chapter 3, verse 28 to 30. Amen and amen. amen. I want to say amen to this one before I tell you. <laughs> the Lord said there's someone here tonight. He said, help will come to you from an unexpected source. Amen. Now you can see why I said amen to that. Help will come to me from an unexpected source. Thank you, Father. The Lord said, someone is here tonight. He said, you will understand. He asked me to tell you to stop sorrowing. He said, because he will restore. Yeah. Okay. If he's talking, then we wait and hear. <laughs> The Lord says there's someone here tonight. He said, very soon you will sing a very popular song. <laughs> now the battle is over. Now that battle is over. Now the battle is over. I am more than a conqueror. Who is that fellow, by the way? <laughs> if you are the one, say amen loud and clear. <laughs> In Daniel chapter 3, verse 28 to 30, Daniel 3, verse 28 to 30, the Bible says that after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fairy furnace, they were promoted. One of the ways God can guarantee you peace on a permanent basis is to promote you far, far beyond the reach of your enemies. And I'm believing that that will be your portion in Jesus' name. Now, peace can be the absence of war. But peace can also be the absence of or the end of a storm. The absence of a storm or the end of a storm. And that brings us to the text that my grandson used tonight. In Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41, Mark 4, verse 35 to 41, when there was a storm and they woke up Jesus Christ and he said, peace be still, the Bible said everything became calm. Now that's peace. It means there was a storm, but the storm subsided. In the name that's above every other name, every storm in your life will subside tonight in Jesus' name. So if you now combine the two names, uh, the, 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 the name, the two parts of the name, Prince of Peace, you know that means the ruler or controller of peace. The ruler or controller of peace. Now, by implication, the one who is going to be the controller of peace must also be the controller of war. Do you know that the reason we haven't seen another world war is because there are at least two superpowers, each one with enough weapons to destroy the world. And so there is, they used to call it a balance of power, or like somebody said, a balance of terror. That's why you find that when America and Russia are quarreling, they talk. Each one keeps threatening the other, but neither is willing to let go one of the weapons of destruction they have because they know if, if either of them should 
go ahead and move. At the end of the day, there will be neither side left alive. Each one has enough power to wipe out the entire world in less than one hour. So the one who controls peace is also the one who controls war. I mean, several years ago, one minister in Nigeria was uh, boasting and said that uh, if America does not behave, <laughs> <laughs> he said we will do something. Ah, look at him. <laughs> what will you do, my friend? <laughs> That's why in Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. Thank you, Father. Psalm 24, verse 7 to 10. This Prince of Peace is also called the Lord, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. The controller of peace is also the controller of war. In Joshua chapter 10, verse 10 to 11, Joshua chapter 10, verse 10 to 11, you discover that this God we are talking about is the first to throw a bomb when Joshua was fighting against a nation, and the nation was trying to escape. God rained down hailstone from heaven. And the Bible said those who were killed by hailstones were more than those who were killed by the sword of Joshua. There is a God who is the greatest air marshal. He is the first one to rain a bomb. And if you can't understand what exactly that one means, then wait till you have to face a witch. I can tell you stories upon stories. I can tell you at least of a woman who sees coming to church with the husband, and the husband says, I don't know what's wrong with her. Will you please come and follow her up? We got there and said, Sister, why are you not coming to church? She said, since I started attending your church, I could no longer fly. All the witches in your home will no longer fly. Our God is the controller of the air. He's the greatest air marshal. On land, is the greatest general. The greatest problem any general has, if you ask them, is what to do with the dead bodies of the enemies they have killed. Because they don't like the dirty job of burying them. And yet, if they don't bury them and they rot, then they could cause a plague. Well, in the case of this God we are talking about, if you read Numbers chapter 16, verse 19 to 34, Numbers 16, verse 19 to 34, when he wanted to deal with his own enemy, he simply asked the ground to open his mouth and swallow them. You know, he, he killed and buried them in one go. I'm praying for someone who is here today. Any form of sickness in your body will disappear into the ground tonight. <laughs> and of course, you know that he is the greatest of all the admirals. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 1 to 28, Exodus 14, verse 1 to 28, when he dealt with Pharaoh and his host, he made sure that they got into the midst of the ocean before he drowned them all. And he didn't have to worry about how to bury them because the fish were there to finish the job. And uh, I am saying to someone here today, I don't know the kind of enemies that have been tormenting you, whether it is the kind that flies or the kind that walks on land or the one that is from the ocean, uh, mami water, spirit or whatever, the greatest of all generals, the greatest of all air marshal, the original admiral, will take care of them all. 
I don't have the time to tell you all the stories. I can take it one by one. I can tell you about witches that couldn't fly. I can tell you about enemies that had to, God had to deal with using the land. But some of you will probably remember the story of that girl that came to us and said, Daddy, I, I'm in trouble. I said, what is the problem? I said, one handsome young man came to me and said, God said I'm the one to, is to marry. I said, what, why, how can that be a problem? He said, because uh, my father told me that when I was born, I was dedicated to mommy water, and that the day I marry, the husband will die. I want to marry this boy, but I don't want him to die. I said, that's no problem. I know a God that can deal with mommy water. We pray a simple prayer, and uh, we left it at that. I didn't see her for some months, and then I went to one church to go and minister, and suddenly I saw my daughter breastfeeding a baby. Ah, he said, Daddy, did you remember me? Ah, how can I forget you? You are the mommy water girl. <laughs> so, I, so I said, but where is the brother? And he pointed him out to me. Mami Water had not been able to kill him. <laughs> Every evil force that has been threatening your destiny shall be dealt with by the controller of war. The one who controls peace is the one who controls war. Prince of Peace also means controller of storms. Is the controller of storms. Mark chapter 4. Thank you, Father. The Lord said there's someone here tonight. He asked me to tell you, I will rebuild your home. Yeah. Hmm. I hope somebody will take note of this. The Lord said there's someone here tonight. He said, Keep knocking. The door is about to open. In Mark chapter 4, verse 41, Mark 4, verse 41, the Bible said, The wind and the sea obey him. He controls storms. He controls storms. And according to Psalm 23, verse 1 to 2, Psalm 23, verse 1 to 2, he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, and then he leads me beside still waters. He won't take you to troubled water. When the water is troubled, he will steal it before leading you there. Now, so we know that the Prince of Peace is the controller of peace or controller of war. He is the controller of storms. Now, let's quickly look at some examples and see for ourselves how he does these things. For example, he can take, praise the Lord, he can take control and he can give you physical peace. When something goes wrong in your body, like I was telling uh, my workers some days ago, it is it, when you suddenly begin to have a temperature as a sign that something is wrong, the doctors will tell you that there are certain agents in your body that God placed there to deal with intruders. So when intruders come, a jam or a virus, the Agents that God has planted in your body to protect you against these invaders, we begin to fight against the invaders. And as they begin to fight, they generate heat. That's why all of a sudden, your temperature begins to rise. Now, according to Jeremiah 32, verse 27, Jeremiah 32, verse 27, our God is the God of all flesh. So when there is a storm within your body or a battle going on within your body, he can step in and create peace 
For instance, in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 to 14, 2 Kings 5, verse 1 to 14, you know the story of uh, Naaman very well. Naaman was a leper. When he came in contact with the God that we serve, this Prince of Peace, the process of bringing him to healing was number one, the demons, the virus or germs, whatever name you want to call it, that was eating up his flesh was silenced. And then God gave him a brand new skin. He still the storm in his body. You might be here tonight and the doctors have told you that your problem is HIV or AIDS or cancer or any of those horrible things that they say, sorry, we don't really have the cure. There is a God who can fight the battles for you. And he will do so in Jesus' name. In the story in Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, in the story of the man who was paralyzed from neck downwards, the nerves in his body were dead. But when he came in contact with the Prince of Peace, he revived the dead nerves. That's why the people said, we've never seen it like this before. Um, uh, it reminds me of... Uh, one or two cases, a relation of mine, a reverend, a reverend uh, gentleman who drove to church one Sunday morning with his wife, conducted the service, finished the service, and as he was walking towards his car, all of a sudden he became completely blind. I mean, totally blind. So he said to the wife, I don't know what is happening, but all I can see is total darkness. And the wife had to lead him by the hand into the car. Interestingly, the wife didn't know how to drive. But the wife now had to guide the husband a step after the other so that he can drive the car home. And then they contacted me. And I said, I know somebody who can restore sight to the blind. And so now I'm saying to those of whom I have some serious eye problems tonight, in the name that's above every other name, receive your sight. Yeah. That's more than two years ago now that my relation is still seen as clearly as anyone else. Just a little prayer to the Prince of Peace, and he intervened. He will intervene in your own case. Yeah. And then he can give you material peace, not just physical peace. He can give you material peace. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 to 7, there was this story of a widow with two sons and a heavy load of debt. Now, if you want to know what is called a storm, you can imagine what happened when the creditors came to her and they said, you have only 24 hours to pay. You don't pay within 24 hours, we will sell your sons. That woman was in a financial storm. But he came in contact with the God who says, silver is mine, gold is mine. And in less than 24 hours, the problem was solved. I have good news for someone here today. As long as Jesus is on the throne, that your financial problem will be solved very soon. There was a man that I went to visit some time ago, and uh, <laughs> I have seen houses. It takes something to surprise me in houses, but when I saw his house, ah, <laughs> this one is different. 
he, he saw the way I was looking. <laughs> I look at the ceiling, I look at the wall. I, he said, Daddy, the only thing in this house that is not imported is sand. Every other thing is imported. I said, I can see that. He said, let me tell you the story. Then he told me the story how he was completely destitute. And God gave him just one breakthrough. And after that one, he never had to lack. I mean, that's why he could build a house that he imported every, everything in the house was imported. Well, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight, but I'm believing God that somebody will get a breakthrough. Yeah. That will take you beyond poverty for the rest of your life. Yeah. It can give you physical peace. It can give you material peace. It can give you mental peace. Like I have said in Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to 22, Daniel 2, verse 20 to 22, wisdom belongs to him. And he can give you a massive dose of wisdom. Massive dose of wisdom. And all you need to get that massive dose of wisdom, particularly if you know yourself that you are not as clever as you ought to be, is asking. James chapter 1, verse 5. James 1, verse 5 says that, if anybody lack wisdom, they should just ask God. Solomon asked God for wisdom. Because he himself knew he was so dumb, he knew he was dumb. So he asked God for wisdom. And the Bible said, God said, all right, I'll give you wisdom. There will be nobody as wise as you before you. Neither will there be any like you after you. If you have a mental problem, and when we say mental problem, we are not saying that you are necessarily mad or crazy. You might not be doing too well at school. I mean, and, and, and I've been a teacher all my life. I know it's not every student who fails who is lazy. I know there are lots and lots of students who are very hardworking, and yet they keep failing. How uh, many of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, very few of you. Well, that's good. It means the rest of you are very clever. <laughs> or you are pretenders. <laughs> and apart from that, it is possible for you to even be clever, hardworking, get to the examination hall, and blank out. If anybody had ever experienced that one before, wave your hand. Ah, okay, that's more now. But I, I've told you the story before. By the grace of God, I was... I had always been good in mathematics, right from primary school all the way. And then there was this particular day. It was a subject that I, I know so well I teach my colleagues when they say they don't understand, I explain to them. Then I got into the exam room. <laughs> and they said, answer five out of eight. I read the first one, blank, couldn't understand it. I read the second question, no, no clue. The third, by now I begin to sweat. The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, ah. I could, I made it all look blank to me. Well, in those days, if you, if you, fail, an ex if you fail a paper, they allow you to come back and do a receipt. So I was about to get up to say, well, if it is like this today, I will go and then come back and do a receipt. But I believe there is this God in heaven who had always been interested in me. Something just says, sit down, sit down. And I sat down. And me, I sat down doing nothing for 15 minutes because I was blank. And then all of a sudden, that same thing said to me, read it again. I read the first one. I know this, this is so, so, so formula. I read the second, I read the third, uh -uh. fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. In spite of the fact that I had wasted 15 minutes, I wrote the answer to all eight, 
And because I was a little rascal there, I wrote at the top of the answer sheet. The lecturer said I should answer any five. I wrote at the top, mark any five. <laughs> I decree to all students who are here tonight, you will never fail another exam. It can give you mental peace. It can give you marital peace. And I believe he's going to do that tonight. Amen. The Lord said there's someone here tonight. This must be a very special case. He said your doctor specializes in nose, ear, and throat. Is there a doctor like that? Do, ah, okay. He said, your doctor specializes in... <laughs> I didn't even know they have doctors like that. Nose, ear, and throat. And the Lord says that your doctor is concerned about your case. He asked me to tell you, relax. I've taken care of the situation. Hmm. Ah, amen. The Lord said that there's someone here tonight. He said, your, this very night, your downward journey ends. Yeah. And your upward journey begins. Glory be to God. And the Lord said there's someone here tonight. He said the door, a door was shut in your face. And that was the beginning of your storm. The Lord asked me to tell you, in less than one month, I will open two new doors. I will say amen to this. Uh, I don't mind claiming it along with the fellow concerned. The Lord said there's someone here tonight. He said, I have told you before, you will laugh last. It can give you marital peace by silencing your mockers. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, if you read it from verse 1 to 5, and then verse 21, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, and verse 51, it tells us the story of uh, the, the song of Hannah after the controller of peace fought her battles for her. She was barren. She happened to be one of the two wives in the house. The other woman was just producing children like rabbits. And, and she kept on mocking this woman, saying, you're just sitting down in my husband's house, eating our food, not producing any child. And then God intervened. And the one that they said was going to die barren started by giving birth to a prophet. And then in addition, got five extra children. Everyone barren here tonight, in the name that's above every other name, tonight your own barrenness will cease. But barrenness is not only the problem one could have maritally. <laughs> there are those who are of marriageable age who are not yet married. And Mama is now beginning to talk to you in Proverbs. <laughs> when, when will you go to your own house? This house is my husband's house. Go to your own. Uh, 
in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Very soon, wedding bell will ring. Or you may be sitting peacefully in your own house, married to your own husband, and then a strange woman comes in. Might my be secretary in the office. Might be somebody that your husband gave a right to. I mean, you know the story. Might be somebody your husband did a, a good turn to, and then she says, I've come to say thank you, sir. And, and thank you, sir, became something else. Every intruder in your home <laughs> shall be chased out in Jesus' name. <laughs> and the amen is so loud, I begin to wonder. <laughs> there might be many, many intruders. The Bible says when demons hear about him, they tremble. They believe in him and they tremble. In, in Mark chapter 1, verse 23 to 27, Mark 1, 23 to 27, the Bible tells us about a man in a synagogue with an unclean spirit. The moment Jesus came in, so the man had been sitting pretty with his demon in the synagogue. He's been singing like others and probably shouting hallelujah like others. But when the Prince of Peace came in, the demon reacted and began to shout, eh, leave us alone. Have you come to destroy us? They know who he is. Now, I don't know how long you have been harboring an unclean spirit. In the name that's above every other name, you will not go out with a single one of them. And so, because of time, he can deal with any storm because he's the Prince of Peace. The wind and the sea obey him. If it's an individual storm, he can deal with it. Like in the case of Mark chapter 5, verse 25 to 34, Mark 5, 25 to 34, the woman with the issue of blood had a pamsana storm. But when he came in contact with the Prince of Peace, that personal storm was stilled. He can deal with family storms. In Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28, Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28, it was not the woman who came to Jesus who had the problem. It was her daughter. But and he say, as a spoken word from the Lord Jesus Christ, the daughter was set free. He can deal with a national storm. And if there be any storm at all in this land, it will be still tonight in Jesus' name. I mean, in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 to 11, 2 Kings 7, verse 1 to 11, the Bible tells us that when a nation was in so much trouble that women were beginning to eat their children, God intervened. And within 24 hours, they have abundance. If you are thinking of a God who can deal with national, national storm, uh, come to Jesus Christ. And I can give you a testimony from my own country, Nigeria. He said, call your children out. Ask them to fast for 100 days. Every one of them, 100 days. And I announced it, and uh, we fasted. At least majority of us did. <laughs> majority of us did. I know some people had their sub garito water. Uh, but we fasted. So by the time we were moving into 2015, I was at peace. Because God told me that the, the fate of my nation had been settled in 2014. The whole world was expecting that by now Nigeria would be burning. Uh, I had contact with some big, big head of states. And when they, when they told me about the amount of illegal arms imported to my country, I trembled. And 
Everybody was saying, if A wins, there'll be fire. If B wins, <laughs> trouble. But look at it. Look at what the Prince of Peace had done. Why don't you help me shout hallelujah to my God? Now, thank you, Father. Lord, so there's someone here tonight. He said, all the enemies within you, within your family, within your business, shall be ejected. Yeah. And all the enemies without shall be repelled. Yeah. Oh, my. The Lord said, there's someone here tonight. He said, this is the darkest moment of your life. He asked me to tell you, relax. Your sun is about to rise. Yeah. Now, all it takes the Prince of Peace to steal any storm is a single word from him. Just one word. Like in the example given us by the first preacher, all he has to do is say, peace, be still. Just one word, and everything will be calm. In uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52, Mark 10, 46 to 52, it, 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 the Bible says, when uh, Bartimaeus, who had been in this storm of darkness for a long time, heard that Jesus was passing by and began to cry out, the moment Jesus Christ said, receive your sight, that was all. And then came to darkness in his life. One word from him. And suddenly, peace will come. Now, there might be some of us who are going through one storm or the other right now. You will hear a word from God tonight. Yeah. And I've told the story before. I was coming to London in our Nigerian Airways of blessed memory. And, and we, came to, we came to Heathrow. I had slept all the way. And they have already asked us to fasten our seat belts. And then suddenly the captain came on the air and said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that we have a little problem. And what is the little problem? The door at the belly of the plane refused to open. That means the landing gear cannot come out. Now that's what he called a, a little problem. Now, <laughs> and I, I was traveling in first class cabin because somebody bought the ticket. And, uh, you know, those in first class, you know the way they behave. They behave as if uh, water cannot drop from their mouth. Butter can melt in their mouth. I mean, like I told some of my children, if you ride in first class, the, the way they laugh is different from every other person. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like, they don't laugh like you laugh. When they want to laugh, eh, eh. That's the rich man laughter. <laughs> Glory be to God. I may not be rich, but I can laugh. Anyway, these people who have been behaving as if uh, butter can melt in their, the moment they heard, <laughs> that we are in trouble. Oh God, pandemonium broke out <laughs> in first class. People began to shout. One woman, judiciously dressed, began to say, oh God, you know I'm going to look after my granddaughter. In... Ah, who asked her? <laughs> I discovered that day that rich people don't want to die. And I will tell you the truth. I was afraid myself. I mean, anointing or no anointing. <laughs> so, <laughs> quickly I began to check my life. Who did I offend? Who didn't I forgive? 
Then after some time, I said, but God, you didn't tell me this is how it's going to end. At that stage, God spoke to me. God will speak to you today. I said, son, don't worry, you're not going to die. I want to talk to you. And I know as soon as we land in London, they won't give us time to talk. And I need to talk to you now. That's why. So you are not going to die. Oh. <laughs> so I relaxed. And we began to talk. In the meantime, confusion reigned supreme. Particularly when the, when the pilot said, ah, lady and gentlemen, calm down now. After all, you know that the firefighters in London are very effective. <laughs> firefighters? You mean we are going to catch fire? <laughs> oh, thank you, my Father and my God. But because God has spoken to me, I was at peace. After we finished talking, the door opened and we landed safely. I mean, otherwise I won't be here today talking to you. Whatever storm may be in your life, receive a word from the Lord today in Jesus' name. And not only can he handle any storm, and I like this bit very much. He can divert a storm. In Luke chapter 22, ah, thank you, my God. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm. The Lord said there's someone here tonight. I know it's me, maybe plus one or two people. He said, your greatest package of joy is receiving finishing touches. And will be delivered soon. I think we should just go home now. That's good enough. <laughs> But daddy says he hasn't finished. Ah, glory be to God. <laughs> you know, somebody prayed a prayer. I think one of the people who led prayer said that uh, this festival of life will mark a turning point <laughs> in our lives. And this one is already marking a turning point <laughs> in my life. Because I'm saying amen to this before I tell you. Daddy says, there is someone here tonight. He said he has seven major breakthroughs for you. <laughs> Beginning before the end of the year. <clears throat> and continuing throughout the coming year. Thank you, Father. Now that's my own. Thank you, Lord. In Luke 22, verse 31 to 32, Jesus Christ said to Simon, he said, Simon, Simon, a storm is coming your way. The devil wants to have you and to, to shift you. The devil wants to take you away and dump you in hell. He said, but I have prayed for you. So the storm is coming, but I've diverted the storm. That brings me to probably the last story I will tell you tonight before I begin to round up. This is a story some of you have heard once, once or twice. And it's a story I love very much. This time, it was couple of years after the, the other one that I've just told you. I was traveling from Lagos to London, this time in British Airways. <clears throat> we sat down, and I was traveling in economy. And in economy, 
you know, the food is not always plenty. Many a times we have to jack it up with coke. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. You keep pretending as if you don't know. <laughs> now, I was a young man. I was traveling economy. And the food I know is not going to be enough anyway. But as they served us, just as they finished serving us, the captain came and said, ladies and gentlemen, the weather boys have told us that by the time we get to London, there is going to be a storm. But uh, don't worry, uh, we have landed in bigger storms before. The moment he said that, the man sitting next to me froze. <laughs> I mean, he just froze. I looked at him from the corner of my eye. I, I, I knew he had frozen. Anyway, I kept on eating. I finished my food. He didn't touch his own food. <laughs> so I, when I finished my food, I looked at him. I said, sir, you are not eating. He looked surprised. He said to me, you speak English? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. You heard what the captain said? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I mean, he was wondering, you mean you had that and you are still able to eat? <laughs> so I looked at him again. I said, you are not eating? He said, no. Can I? <laughs> Don't forget I was a young man then, so. <laughs> So he said, okay. So I took his tray and I gave him my own. <laughs> I finished his food and fell asleep. <laughs> when we got to Heathrow and just in, in there, the captain said, well, ladies and gentlemen, the weather boys deceived us. The storm that they said will be in London is actually in Scotland. Ha! <laughs> I looked at my neighbor. <laughs> he looked at me, and both of us began to laugh. <laughs> I know he's laughing out of relief. But I'm laughing because there's nothing he could do about his food. <laughs> <laughs> then God spoke to me. I said, son, the weather boys were not wrong. But because of you, I diverted the storm. I've told you the story before. And I prophesied along that line. And I'm prophesying tonight again to the life of someone here. Any storm coming your way shall be diverted. <laughs> Let's conclude. Tonight, let me talk to those of you who have not given your life to Jesus. Sooner or later, storms do come. Isaiah 43, verse 2. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, When you pass through the river, it will not overflow you, because I will be with you. When you pass through fire, it will not burn you. When, not if. That means it's a matter of time. If Jesus is not in the boat of your life, when your storm comes, you will sink. The difference between a Christian who has Christ in his boat and 
one who has not surrendered his life to Jesus Christ is that when storms come, the Christian has Jesus to wake up and say, Arise and help. The sinner has nobody to call on. As for you sinners, in a moment I'm going to give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. If you like, surrender. If you like, don't. You never can tell when the storm will come. Let me talk to some of you who are once born again. And then after some time, you began to hear all manners of doctrines. And some people began to sell you this doctrine of cheap grace. That says once you are born again, you can now begin to live anyhow. That once you are born again, you can go on fornicating, you can go on lying, you can go on cheating, no problem. Once you are born again, you are forever born again. That's a lie from hell. Because Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, alone, even, even though there are many others. Romans 6, verses 1 and 2 say, can we continue in sin? and expect grace to abound? What is the answer? God forbid. Uh, some people say, no, it doesn't matter. I mean, once you are born again, you can fornicate, you can commit adultery, you, ah, uh ah, -huh. Are we reading the same Bible? Because Apostle Paul, the apostle of grace, is the one who said, when you are born again, your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. Is that correct? And is the one who, who wrote down for us, the apostle of grace, wrote that God says, if any man defies my temple, I will destroy him. So if you Backslid because you fell prey to this false doctrine that says all it all you have to worry about just get born again you have no more responsibility from there on you can live any kind of life and as a result of that you have gone back to doing those things that you say you would never do before I appeal to you tonight. Once I make, make the altar call, come and surrender your life to Jesus for restoration. Then let me talk to those of you who are Christians. You're not backsliding. You are genuinely born again. You are sure of your standing in the Almighty God. And yet, you are facing some storms. How come? Well, I don't know if you ever read Isaiah 48, verse 18. Isaiah 48, verse 18 says, Oh, that you had hearkened to all my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river. Your peace would have been like a river. Have you been obeying all? the commandments of the Lord? Or have you been selective in the commandments that you obey? If that is the situation, then you have a lot of repenting to do tonight because God wants to give you peace like a river and it's just waiting for your obedience to be complete. And so, Let's start with those of us who want to surrender our life to Jesus. Those of us who want to say, Lord, I don't want any more storm in my life. Will you just come now and surrender your life to Jesus? Because the moment he is in your life, then when storms come, you call on him and he will speak a word and say, peace, be still. So I'm going to count from one 
to 12, because some of you are very far away. If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, come very quickly. He will receive you tonight. He will save your soul. And those of you who are backsliding and you want to be restored to fellowship with him, you can come too while I'm counting from 1 to 12. I have beginning now. One. Two. The choice is yours. If you want to face your battles alone, no problem. You can sit down there pretending that you are born again when you know you are not and be in your backsliding state and refuse to move. Or some of you will be thinking, what will my friends say if they see me going forward? Ah, let's see which of your friends will be able to fight your battles for you or will be able to steal the storms in your life. Three, if you are coming, you have to come very quickly. Now, those of you who are clapping, thank you, keep clapping. Your hands will never be empty. Four. Don't wait for anyone, and those of you who are far off, you will have to hurry up before I get to 12. Five. Now, whatever is what doing is what is what doing very well. If you are clapping for Jesus, do it very well. Do it very well. Do it very well. Six. Keep coming. This is your day. This is your day of salvation. This is your day of restoration. The Prince of Peace is the one inviting you, saying, Come now. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He said, You come. Come to him. And come and take his, come and take his yoke upon you and learn of him. And then he will give you peace. He will give you peace. They're on the way. Keep clapping. Encourage them. Encourage them. Eight. Come on, rejoice. Rejoice with these people getting rid of all the shackles of Satan. Move very quickly. Move very quickly. I know you are coming from a long distance, but you have to hurry up. You have to hurry up. Keep clapping, brethren. Your hands will never wither. Keep clapping. There are so many of them coming. Keep clapping. Very soon, those hands. Keep clapping. Nine. Thank you, Jesus. And if you know you should be in front here yeah, and you are sitting down, you never can tell. This might be your last opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus. This might be your last opportunity to have this great and mighty God. Ten. I'm rounding up now. Please hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Those of you who are far away, you have to move a little faster. Keep coming. Don't stop, by the way. Just make sure that you get here before I finish praying, because I will soon be praying. Keep coming. Keep coming. I can see you. I can see you still far away. Many of you still coming. Eleven. That is that's the final countdown. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up now. Yes, God bless you. I can see you moving faster now. That's better. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Now, those of us who are already in front, begin to talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell him, Lord, have mercy on me. I've come to surrender my life to you today. Please forgive all my sins. I don't want to fight my battles alone anymore. Come into the boat of my life, Lord Jesus. Come in, come in, come into my life. Come and take control. Call on him. Ask him to save your soul. Ask him to forgive all your sins. And those of you on the way, please hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Now, the rest of us, let's stretch our hands towards these people. 
and pray for them. Pray that the one who saved our souls will save their own souls also. Intercede for them, brethren. Pray that God will forgive all their sins and wash them clean with his blood. Everybody, please, in and pray for them. Pray for them. And those of you who are still on the way, please hurry up. Get here before I finish praying because I'm about to pray now. I'm about to pray for salvation. So if you're on the way, hurry up. Yes, I can see some of you still moving fast. Yes, just keep coming. Keep coming. And pray as you come along. Ask Jesus to save your soul. Ask him to forgive your sins. Ask him to cleanse you in his blood. Thank you, Father. Glory be to your holy name. If anyone else is still coming, just come. I'm about to pray now. Make sure you get here before I finish praying. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Ancient of days, I thank you. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for all these people that have responded to your word by coming forward to surrender their lives to you. Father, remember your promise that whosoever will come unto you, you will no wise cast out. They have come to you now, Father. Please receive them in Jesus' name. Amen. Forgive them in Jesus' name. Amen. Let your blood wipe away their sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Save their souls right now and write their names in the book of life. And Father, I pray that from today onward, any time they call on you, you will answer them by fire. Amen. Please don't let them go back into the world. Amen. And those ones that you have restored to yourself today, let them remain restored forever. Amen. And Father, I'm praying that from this moment onward, these people will serve you and serve you to the end. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, those of you who have come forward, let me hear you shout hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm rejoicing with you because right now, according to the word of God, because of you, Jesus is dancing in heaven. He's dancing before his angels. So congratulations. And second reason why I'm rejoicing with you is that by the special grace of God, from tonight onward, Every day of my life, I'll be praying for you. And so I'm going to need your names, your address, and your prayer request. And I promise you as a man of God, I'll be praying for you. Very soon, you'll be receiving miracles. Some miracles you do not even ask for. Then you will know somebody must be somewhere praying for you. And that somebody is me. That's a promise. So if you please turn to your left, you see somebody with a placard with FOL written in red. Kindly follow him. Some pastors are waiting over there. They will collect the, your names, your address, your prayer requests, and they bring you back very quickly. And we will wait for you before we do anything further. So please begin to go in that direction. Now let's clap for Jesus now. Really, really clap for Jesus. Think over your life. Think of all the areas where you have not been faithful to God, where you have not obeyed all his commandments. Because the first thing we are going to do when it is time to pray now, after thanking him, is to apologize for what we have done wrong. And there's no need apologizing if you are not going to change. So the few minutes while we are waiting for our brothers to come and join us, let it be heart searching. Search your hearts. In what area have I been failing, my God? Think about them and then begin quietly to make a resolution that you are going to change. And then I will soon come back and it will be time for us to pray. <laughs> 